Well, it's expensive to get diagnosed with a visual snow today because the doctors were, are hunting for, uh, for a problem. And the CAT scan and the MRI scan and the PET scan, uh, as is known in the clinic at this time, do not show the resolution necessary. So they always come back with negative answers saying it's no, nothing in the record from those scans shows anything. Uh, there are some new uh, techniques, uh, particularly MRI techniques, that are promising uh, down the road, uh, but they still need more development. So there's no real, uh, it's expensive right at the moment because they're, they're just looking for things. The diagnosis for visual snow has been that you're, the subject is crazy. Uh, that's the closest thing to a diagnosis that most doctors have made. And that's not very satisfying to the client, obviously. So there is no real visual snow uh, uh, criteria at the moment. There is a, several people have, uh, in the clinical community have listed uh, symptoms of visual snow, but not in a, in a comprehensive manner. And that's one of the things that's going to come out of this uh, conference and hopefully out of the uh, statistics that I'm going to be gathering. The diagnosis is largely um, a consequence of seeing a clinical specialist who in the first place acknowledges that visual snow is a thing and then the conducting of a numerous tests to rule out any associated symptoms or disorders. So we're relying on a subjective experience. At this point in time we can't measure snow. We can only listen to a patient and hear, their, hear about their experiences and there's no, no mechanism to measure that. So really it's by exclusion at this point in time. Well the official diagnosis of visual snow uh, is, is difficult because it's still a clinical impression. Uh, in terms of the uh, investigation, uh, all of the investigations are there really uh, to exclude um, uh, alternative diagnoses. Uh, structural diagnosis in particular. To be fair, I think if you present with the clinical features of visual snow syndrome as they have been recently defined, uh, then the diagnosis should be made at an initial consultation with somebody who understands what they're dealing with. Um, investigation, and that, that's the cost of a consultation with a competent neurologist, uh, neuro-ophthalmologist or ophthalmologist. Um, in real terms, the investigations probably don't need to go beyond um, a, an MRI to exclude some underlying diffuse abnormality within the brain. Uh, and you will sometimes see abnormality in people who have previously been uh, exposed to hallucinatory drugs and can present with similar symptoms. I think uh, the syndrome is more diffuse in them, but they will sometimes have structural abnormalities. Um, but you should have picked that up historically as well. So the, the overall costs of being certain of the diagnosis should be fairly low. Now, for research purposes, we do a lot more than that. We do visual electrophysiology. Uh, we have a full psychological evaluation of the patients. We have uh, full imaging, which we're probably going to expand to functional imaging. But these are research tools, and these are to be more specific. I think the diagnosis itself should be you walk in, you give them the story and they say you've got visual snow. Should not be expensive. Today um, people look at you and either they say I can't help you which is not uncommon or they send you for MRIs and they send you for EEGs uh, and they send you for uh, a psychological evaluation. The, um, the cost of that varies from country to country but in an Australian uh, setting, much of it's covered by a, a, a national insurance scheme. Uh, so you might be out of pocket all up maybe $1,000 to have a, a comprehensive evaluation. Uh, I don't know what that would cost in the United States, but working on average uh, just for that initial assessment, you might be talking about $10,000 or more. Just, just for the diagnosis or just to be told that you're crazy because you don't necessarily get the diagnosis once you've done all of that. That's very dependent on the practitioner you go to. So the diagnosis of visual snow is clinical. It's taking a history and there are certain features. And we published um, 
uh, criteria for this, and they're, they're now in one of the um, they're now published in journals. So there's a there are there are criteria, if you like, to, to having visual snow. They don't involve tests, but they involve an otherwise normal nervous system. The number of tests that are required depends on what the physician thinks uh, thinks you have. So that the if a, if a physician recognises the syndrome that you describe as visual snow, then you don't really need very many tests. If they don't recognise it, then sometimes a lot of tests get done before the penny drops. You don't need tests to diagnose visual snow. You may need tests for reassurance. You may need tests to feel more comfortable about it. You don't really need them to diagnose it. So often uh, I'm the third or fourth person that the patient has seen. Uh, all the way from a GP to who are, to optometrist, being a specialist, that's how it is. So I think when they come in, patient comes in, uh, being an ophthalmologist, for us it's all about vision, right? So they go through a whole battery of visual tests. We check their visual acuity, we check their uh, eye pressure, we check their visual fields, and especially if they have visual snow type symptoms, uh, we'll do other tests to make sure the eye's okay. We'll do a test called the OCT. Um, we will do, you know, other sort of uh, uh, tests of, of the retina. We'll dilate the patient's eyes, so the patient's eyes will be dilated, and they won't be able to see for about, or sorry, won't be able to see close up for about four or five hours. And then um, after everything's done, then they'll sit and uh, see us, and then we'll sort of go through all the tests and then talk to them about what's going on. The visual snow syndrome is actually a, a conglomeration of symptoms and in order to make the diagnosis of the syndrome as opposed to the symptom, uh, you need not only to have the visual snow symptom itself, but you have to have at least a couple of the other commonly uh, represented symptoms, uh, several of which are visual. You can have persistence of images, what's called palinopsia. Uh, you can have nyctalopia, which is night blindness. Uh, photophobia is quite common, so the light hurts. Um, you can have what are called entoptic phenomena, which are uh, visual impressions that are generated within the eye and not filtered out, so that they come to consciousness. Um, it's not uncommon to have other sensory symptoms as well. Uh, tinnitus is a, common, is a common symptom, so the constant buzzing in the ears. Uh, but there are other things that I think occur with greater frequency in this community as well. Migraine is strongly associated with it, but not part of the syndrome. D dissociative features uh, I find problematic. Um, and I think if you're going to define the syndrome tightly, I don't, I don't include it in the syndrome. That doesn't mean it's not necessarily part of it. It just means that it's really hard to quantify and consider it. And in terms of studying the syndrome, um, it is uh, important to uh, keep it as pure as possible. Now there, there, there are a subgroup, there is a subgroup of, of patients who have dissociative uh, features. Is that part of the syndrome? Um, not as we define it, but remember a syndrome is as we define it. Do patients with visual snow have dissociative features? Yes. Is that organic or functional as in the psychological sense? I have no doubts it's organic. There's no such thing as a psychological uh, symptom that doesn't have an underlying organic explanation. Uh, whether you're talking about neurosis or psychosis, the brain is an organism that, that works on the basis of electrical signals, neurotransmitters. To get anything out of it, there's an underlying organic basis for it.